Thank you. Thank you all. It's great for you to be here. Uh, we couldn't be talking about a more important subject. And Michael, first thing I want to say is how wonderful it is for me to be up here with you. You might have noticed in the biographies there's some overlap. Uh, we've been in the trenches together a lot uh, over the well, years. Don was my boss, to be precise. And, I will, <laughs> and, and so just I to be really, best. really precise, Michael never had a boss. So, <laughs> right? But but it is meaning, meaningful for me to be up here. I, You won't remember this. I remember the first time I met you. I even remember the second time I met you. So, uh, And they were both important moments for me in my life. And as the years have gone on, the relationship has been a very important one. Um, I love this book. It's uh, We've talked about it. It's it, it, And I encourage you to buy it if you haven't. It, it, in fact, even if you have, buy some more. It is uh, an incredible combination of history, of current affairs, of political science, of call to action, and, and actually a sort of practical guide to what to do about some of the challenges that we're facing and not just lamenting the problems. Um, I want to first take a read on our audience here. Right? Because I think that's always a pretty important... I'm in communication, so that's what we do. Um, how many people here are lawyers? Oh, my God. How many people here are uh, partnered with someone who's a lawyer or have a child who's a lawyer? Just keep all the hands up as we go, right? <laughs> lawyers, partners with lawyers, children as lawyers. How many people here are lawyers but don't practice law and haven't practiced law for a long, long time, right? Okay. Okay. Um, I, Michael and I know the feeling. Um, I, I, for years, I, I, what she didn't read in my biography was I was a practicing lawyer for three years, five months, and three days in New York City. <laughs> I've used that line a lot over the years. And um, I call myself a lapsed lawyer, not a reformed you know, lawyer or anything like that, because a recovering lawyer. Because, and I'm not Catholic, uh, but friends of mine who are say that being a lawyer is like being a Catholic. You never really get it out of your system. So for all of you, we're here to really talk about what is in your system and, you know, that you can't help yourself with. Um, and so it's also good. We have so many lawyers here. Uh, Thomas Paine reportedly said that in America, the law is king. Uh, we're kind of in a period in our history where we are testing that. So it's great to be here in the royal court with all of you, <laughs> all right? Michael, before we get into the book, because I always think these are important questions, not just how did we get here, how did you get here? Talk, uh, give us some about your background and how you came to be someone who would write this book. Well, first of all, thank you to everybody for being here, and thank you, Don, for doing this. It is a, a real treat for me to do this with you. I learned so much... Uh, so much from you, remembered much of it, though not all. Um, and uh, and part of what I try to bring to the work that I do at the Brennan Center is to understand how important it is to win in the court of public opinion, which is something we tried to do in, in government every day, and it was really such an incredible experience to do it with you um, and to be your friend. I, you. I, I went to law school. Um, I, afterwards, I went to uh, Washington, D.C., where I ran a consumer group, Public Citizens Congress Watch. And then in 1992, I left and moved to Little Rock, Arkansas, um, to work for then Governor Clinton in the presidential campaign. Um, came into the White House not as a speechwriter, but actually as a policy aide. Um, I, my title originally was I was special assistant to the president for policy coordination. And I always said that that was a setup because there was a lot of policy and no coordination, and I wasn't going to take the fall. Um, but got more and more involved with speech writing because it, presidential speeches for that president, but for so many presidents, are where policy and politics and presidential personality all come together. The president's words are often the way a president moves the country. Um, so we did that uh, uh, until 1999. Then I moved back to New York. I taught at the Kennedy School, briefly practiced law. I thought that was probably an important thing to do. And then I've been at the Brennan Center since 2005 for 17 years. And we've, uh, we've built it into what is, because of the crisis facing the country when it comes to democracy and justice, a very busy uh, organization. And uh, Brennan Center itself, I mean, is is an interesting organization. I'm sure this group would like to know more about it. 
just give us another sentence or so about what you actually do. So we're, we're a nonpartisan law and policy institute. We work as we see it to strengthen, reform, and, and when necessary to defend the systems of democracy and justice so they work for everybody. Um, we, were, we were named after, we were actually started by the clerks and family of Justice William Brennan when he left the Supreme Court um, b before I was involved with it. Uh, and we we're a pretty central force, I think, in the fight to protect democracy in the country, which right now, as you can imagine, is, is uh, all-consuming. Um, Justice Brennan, I'm told, when they started the Brennan Center, they went to him and said, um, you know, Justice Brennan, we want to start this organization, name it after you, is, is that okay? We're affiliated with NYU Law School. Uh, is it okay if we start this center, we're going to affiliate with law school with your name on it? And he said, you know, not surprisingly, why? Yes, that would be just fine, <laughs> with, with, with one exception. He said, I'm going to be up there watching. <laughs> and if I see that you're just following my views on things, I'm going to be really mad because that would be originalism. And you know what I think of originalism. So that's what counts as Supreme Court Justice humor, by the way. But he also liber <laughs> he liberated us from the start to really think for ourselves and to try to create a both a critique, but even more a, a vision for American democracy that we try to carry out. So we know a bit about how you got here. I want to talk about how we, as a country, got here. And start, uh, the title of the book is The Supermajority. What, what does that mean? It turns out numbers matter greatly uh, in this instance. Uh, there are right now six uh, very conservative justices on the nine justice Supreme Court moving mostly, not always, but mostly in lockstep, working hard and fast to move the country in a very different direction by changing the court, by changing how the Constitution is interpreted, um, the book focuses especially on the first year, the first full year of that supermajority, um, which ended in June of 2022, just a year ago. Um, and uh, it was a significant, I knew before starting to write it that it was going to be an important year because this was the first time that the, the, the supermajority was there in full force. And as it turned out, it was both a very dramatic year, a contentious year. The justices were publicly attacking each other. There were leaks and threats. And then in the end, very dramatic, very significant, and I would argue very extreme rulings on key issues. So as I mentioned before, one of the things I love about the book is your exploration of the history of the Supreme Court. And when you go back, you realize there was nothing set about First off, this court being preeminent in America, uh, much less the course that we would have been on. Um, and you describe uh, sequences throughout our history of action and backlash and reform and change over time. So it's not the first time we've been here. Um, I, first one, really, in some respects, was the 1850s with the Dred Scott decision. Talk a bit about what we have seen over time in terms of how uh, the court has acted, why it has acted, uh, and moved in directions it has moved, and then what has changed over the course of time. Yeah, and, and the history to me was really interesting in learning it as I was writing it, and, and trying to avoid getting fully down the rabbit hole of the history is, is, is hard, but there's so much to learn from. Y you know, we, um, when you look at the to total history of the country, the Supreme Court, generally speaking, reflects the political consensus of the country at the time, or at least the elite political consensus. It more or less hugs the middle. Um, and in a sense, that's how it has the credibility to make these rulings without the ability to enforce them, but, but, but the political system goes along. Um, but there have been a few times in the country's history, not always, but a few times, where there's been overreach, where the court has been extreme or partisan or unduly activist. And when that has happened, there's been a fierce backlash, um, uh, uh, including a political backlash. People protested, they voted. Um, the, it led in many instances to political realignment. The first time was Dred Scott, as Don said. So, you know, we all know from high school history or, or anything else uh, uh, that um, judicial review was Marbury, you know, established in Marbury versus Madison. 
that wasn't ultimately that important because they never did it again for a long time. Um, the only the second time the Supreme Court struck down an act passed by Congress was Dred Scott. And that was the ruling where there was a great deal of agitation about slavery. Um, uh, uh, um, abolitionism was rising, and uh, the slave power in the South was trying to push its advantage. Um, and the Supreme Court said, oh, we're going to, quote, solve the problem, by which they didn't mean the problem of slavery, that, by, by, by which they meant the problem of people complaining about slavery. And the ruling, as you probably know, said, uh, first of all, that Congress could not prohibit slavery from the territories. In other words, slavery could not be con contained in the South, but that, in fact, it was national. And it also said, in this particularly egregious uh, part of the ruling, that black people could not be citizens, that they were so inferior that they could not be citizens. And this was hugely, hugely controversial at the time. So first of all, this was, for those of you who follow recent politics uh, and think about the leak of the Dobbs decision, this was the first really big Supreme Court decision to leak. It didn't leak to Politico <laughs> um, at the time. It leaked to the incoming president-elect. Which Buchanan. Politico was very yeah. unhappy about yeah. in 1850. Well, the printing presses, you know, took yeah. too long. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, own, own the news cycle, you know. Um, the, uh, Buchanan wanted them... He was a northerner, but pro-slavery and pro-South, and he wanted them to rule this way. He secretly lobbied them and knew everything that was going on. They notified him what they were doing, and then he got up and gave his inaugural address a few days before the ruling came out. And he said in his inaugural, he said, well, the Supreme Court is, we all know the Supreme Court is going to make this big ruling on, on slavery. None of us know what it's going to say. Let's all just agree that whatever they say, we're going to go along with it, right? <laughs> and, and the newspapers the next day all said, oh, well, now we know what that means. It led to a fierce backlash. It led to Abra the rise of Abraham Lincoln to the presidency. It led to the rise of the Republican Party. Um, in the end, that all helped bring on the Civil War and the end of slavery. Um, and, and the 14th Amendment and the Reconstruction Amendments after that. Again, it, led, it was not something that was just seen as the province of lawyers. It was seen as the stuff and substance of appropriate, robust political debate by regular people. And actually, Abraham Lincoln, in his inaugural address four years later, he got up with Roger Taney sitting there, the guy who wrote this horrible opinion, uh, preparing to swear Lincoln in. Lincoln said, you know, some people say <laughs> the Supreme Court should decide what the Constitution means. We all know that can't be true because they're just unelected, nine unelected people. What kind of democracy do we have if they can strike down laws of Congress? So these very issues that we discuss now uh, were what they fought about in and out in those days. And, and I just want to point out, uh, Michael and I worked on one inaugural address together in 1997. He worked on two because he also worked on the 93 one for President Clinton. How much easier would it have been if we could have just announced Supreme Court decisions yeah. in the inaugural address? Yeah, no, it would have been, would have been uh, shorter. I, yeah, shorter, yeah. right. That was always the problem. All right, so, so this is not the only time, right? I mean, you roll forward uh, almost a century, 70, 80 years. Well, the second time was in the early 20th century. Right. Comes in what uh, a period, in some respects, like now, in that there was massive social change, massive economic change, the Gilded Age, the rise of industrialism, massive new wealth inequality uh, with the rise of trusts, national corporations, um, demographic change, both both the, the attack on the rights of formerly enslaved black people in the South, but immigration flooding into the cities. And the Supreme Court in that era, and those of you <laughs> who had your hands up who are or were lawyers know of it as the Lochner era, um, the Supreme Court of that time thought its job was to make sure government couldn't do anything about it, uh, to strike down efforts to protect workers' rights, women, public safety, and all those other regulatory matters that were to try to bring some order to the, the new industrial economy. Um, and uh, the, Lochner was a particularly notorious case that said that you couldn't limit, uh, that the law limiting the hours of bakery workers in New York to 10 hours a day was unconstitutional. Oh, someone else has got, we will talk louder. So much preaching or, or we'll over yell. there, I think. 
Would you prefer that we talk louder or yell? That, yeah, yeah. The Lochner case was really bad. Um, uh, and, and again, this period was uh, saw a massive, massive backlash, political, not just academic. I had not realized until researching this, um, the fabled 1912 presidential candidate campaign, when Teddy Roosevelt ran for president as the Bull Moose progressive candidate, and he was challenging um, William Howard Taft, his hand-picked successor, and Woodrow Wilson was the Democrat, and Eugene Debs, the socialist, was the fourth candidate. It's like, a, it's a very epic campaign. Teddy Roosevelt's big issue was taking on the Supreme Court, taking on the Lochner ruling and these other reactionary rulings, and he actually had some radical proposals that there should be ballot initiatives that could overturn Supreme Court decisions and that sort of thing. This, uh, this was the, the stuff of politics, and it led up to the 1930s when his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, had his big fight with the Supreme Court on the same issues. You don't want to mess with those Roosevelt's if you're a right, right. Supreme Court justice. Well, and when it didn't work out for Taft in that 1912 election, he got to go on the Supreme Court, right? So, it, one, of the, one of the things history teaches and often surprises us, when, as, uh, even younger uh, progressive lawyers and law students are, are unnerved by this. Until quite recently, the people who were on the U.S. Supreme Court were people like former President William Howard Taft. They were senators, governors, attorneys general, presidents, people who had achieved a lot in their careers. Now, seven of eight, eight of the nine are former federal appeals court judges with a very technical, narrow expertise. So. You've talked about the history of two instances that were really the right asserting itself. There's an instance of the center left left asserting itself in most of our lifetimes that actually led to the backlash that we're now living with the repercussions of. So the Warren Court right. is another example. And this is complicated because, as I mentioned, the Brenna Center is named after Justice Brennan, who was one of the leaders of the Warren Court. So the one time the court was... Uh, truly activist, but was not in a reactionary way. The one time the court was ahead of the country, arguably, on rights and advancing equality was the Warren Court, starting in 1953 when Earl Warren became Chief Justice. And it lasted... Appointed, appointed by Eisenhower, Eisenhower. And a Republican governor himself, right? Right. And Brennan was, was also appointed by Eisenhower. Right. Um, it, it, impossible to imagine with a recess appointment, meaning the Senate never voted on it for a while because it was so non-controversial because that was how they did it in those days. Um, the Warren Court had to do really important things to break the logjam, to break the hold, the broken political process, especially in the South. So the first big case it did was Brown v. Board of Education, which of course declared uh, segregation in public education to be unconstitutional. Um, it, it, Warren made sure it was unanimous. Warren made sure the decision was only 10 pages long so that people could understand it. It did not itself have the force of, of action. 10 years later, uh, only 3% of black school children were going to uh, integrated schools in the South. The real action didn't happen until the civil rights movement and the civil rights laws were passed uh, at the prodding of the civil rights movement and the protesters a decade later. But this launched a period of tremendous activism. I am massively enthusiastic in support of the substance of m almost all of these rulings. Um, other examples where they broke through the logjam was uh, the one person, one vote rulings, which said that you could not have vastly unequal political districts and really introduced political representational equality in a lot of ways, but so many other things, banning school prayer, uh, on and on and on, up until uh, after Warren actually uh, passed away, um, cases like uh, culminating with Roe v. Wade, which we're all so familiar with. And when you step back and look at the pace of decisions they made, again, also not elected officials, but justices, um, there was so much of it that it began to create its own backlash. I, it's a long backlash, and in many respects, we're still living with that backlash today and seeing its culmination. But the glow of the Warren Court 
the idea that the Supreme Court was this noble platonic guardians of freedom that we could all be aspiring to move and, and, and looking to in the end actually lasted a lot longer than the court did. And we, all of us, need to be grappling with our own misperceptions of the Supreme Court even now. So I, I want to talk about the politics of this period, because uh, it, part of what comes through in the history of all of this is that this is a political institution. And it's also one that is uh, affected by the politics around it. And there are forces that take full advantage of that. And there are other forces that perhaps aren't as effective or haven't been as effective, especially in our lifetimes at taking. So coming out of the period of the Warren Court, um, there's the formation of a number of organizations funded by uh, major uh, conservative right-wing um, uh, nonprofits, for the most part, sometimes by corporations. But the, the creation of the Federalist Society, uh, which uh, I think at Yale University, I may have that wrong, but at yeah. Yale University, it was Law a School, student club, which, which which may surprise some people here, but uh, you know was was not just something a student club where you know they could put it on their resumes and maybe get clerkships out of it. It was in fact a very intentional effort to create a long-running, decades-long campaign. And I'll just pause a minute. September 2020, when Justice Ginsburg died in the middle of the turmoil of the pandemic and the 2020 uh, election campaign and everything that the country was struggling with. Um, I remember hearing pundits on, on TV, Michael, you might have been one of them, who, <laughs> who said that Trump and the Republicans had won this battle. And I remember th thinking to myself, you don't get it. They just won the war. Hmm. Uh, that was, this is what they had been about for almost 50 years. So uh, what? talk about what happened there, because it's in your book, and about the long-running cap campaign and effort that went behind it. And uh, You're exactly right. And I wrote about this in even greater detail in, the, in an earlier book the, on the Second Amendment and how it came to be that we, for almost the entire history of the country, the Second Amendment was understood to not protect an individual right to gun ownership for self-defense. That changed because of a long-running, decades-long constitutional campaign, in that instance, by the NRA and other libertarian and conservative groups. But it was part of a massive effort. You know, in the immediate aftermath of Roe v. Wade um, and these other cases, Roe v. Wade was not terribly controversial and was not terribly um, unpopular at the time that it, it was issued. Um, it took a while. Uh, but the first thing that uh, opponents tried to do was pass constitutional amendments. And then they realized that was very hard, so they said, we're not going to try to change the Constitution, we're going to change the judges. And they had this long drawn effort to change the complexion, the character, and the philosophical approach of the federal courts. And you're right, it started, the Federalist Society is like nothing else we've ever had in American history. I, I think that when you look at this court right now, basically a faction of a faction has captured this branch of the federal government. They started as a student club at Yale and at Chicago. Over time, and they still have interesting panel discussions and things like that, but they are really, in fact, a very, very effective, very well-oiled, and it turns out, very well-funded political machine. Um, what year did it start? 1984, I think, something like that. It was early on. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, I used to, at running the a nonprofit, as I do, I used to look at the Federalist Society and say, wow, they're really pretty effective. And they don't actually seem to have that much money. Uh, but then it turned out that, for example, someone had, one person had given uh, Leonard Leo, the uh, leader of the Federalist Society a few years ago, $1.6 billion secretly to use for the entirety of the political operation, not just the Federal Society, but they run tens of millions of dollars of ads whenever somebody is nominated that they support. Uh, ad, they ran, t I did not realize this, they ran tens of millions of dollars of ads praising the senators who blocked Merrick Garland from, here, from getting a hearing in Congress. Um, and they create the groups that file the cases that are before the court and that file the briefs in front of the court. And all these justices and judges are handpicked by the Federalist Society. Donald Trump, when he was running for president in the spring of 2016, conservatives did not trust him. 
So a way he said, oh, I'm going to show that I'm going to I'm going to play ball. He said, in effect, I don't really care about all this court stuff. <laughs> it's yours. And he agreed to appoint justices from a list presented to him by the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. And again, there's always been a lot of politics in politics, there's always been a lot of politics surrounding the court. This is, as I said yesterday, this is not a religious institution. They wear robes, but they're not wizards. They're nine government officials. But it's never been as, as, as much a part of a political machine as this, I think, in American history. I mean, when we, this is a country obsessed with conspiracies, real and fake. You know, the, 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 um, the Masons, <laughs> QAnon, this has happened in plain sight. Um, and it's very unusual. There's one other thing thing that I'll mention, which, which sort of was a surprise. And all of this is before recent days. The fundamental challenge we face in some respects to me is that the country is moving in one direction and the court is veering sharply in another. The country is more diverse. It is more open to governmental action. Uh, and, and the court is, is moving hard in a different ideological direction. Demo this is an empirical, not a partisan point. One party, the Democrats, have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. That is the longest winning streak in American history for a political party in the popular vote. But Republican presidents have appointed six of the nine justices. Including uh, one president who was in office for four years, who was not elected with the majority of the uh, uh, votes, who appointed one third of the court, three right. of the justices. And right? George W. Bush was elected in his first term without a majority right. either. It, here's another, Democrats and Republicans have split control of the White House kind of roughly evenly for the last half century. R Republican appointees have had a majority on the Supreme Court since 1970. Yeah. So that predates Mitch McConnell. It's, some of it is luck, but it's a fundamentally it's an institution that can be out of whack and increasingly is out of whack so with the country. just one footnote to this point about the Federalist Society, because it hasn't only been that student club. It has been a long-running campaign, well-funded. And here's an interesting footnote tidbit that relates back to the Supreme Court. I think it was in 1972 or 1973 uh, a prominent lawyer from Richmond, Virginia, was hired, I think by some combination of chambers of commerce, to do a secret study on how we had gotten to the point in the country that the Warren Court had opened up all of these pathways towards expanding rights and liberties and the like. And in particular, from a business standpoint, from a corporate standpoint, what could be done to sort of hold back that tide? Um, and his, his report said that what was lacking was serious funding and sustained effort over time that that funding would support. The author of that report was a lawyer named Lewis Powell, who went on, of course, to be appointed by President Nixon to the Supreme Court. Um, not to take anything away from Justice Powell and uh, his, his own legacy, but it's fascinating to recognize what, that he, he was president the creation of, of a lot of this. What I would give for Justice Powell and his jurisprudence now. Right. Um, Jane, Jane Mayer, who was here yesterday, and I don't know if she's here today, has written about this, this a lot. This really was a blueprint, and what's striking when you read the Powell memo is it talks about the neglected courts how business and conservative interests just had neglected the courts and assumed they were they were not worth worrying about. So that certainly is a so, change. So we're going to open this to questions in about 10 minutes. But I, I, I want to dwell on a few things, because I, I, I keep coming back to the politics of all of this. So uh, first off, um, you mentioned Merrick Garland, now the Attorney General, nominated by President Obama in January or February of 2016 uh, for an opening. Uh, uh, and he, it was roadblocked uh, within the Senate because of the control of the Senate by Republicans. Um, talk some about the dynamic there. And then how was it that four years later, there's an opening in the court when Justice Ginsburg died um, and uh, Justice Barrett winds up on the court with about six weeks of consideration and, and only about six weeks before the election. You're exactly right. So what happened with Merrick Garland 
it was a year before, just about a year before a new president would take office. In other words, plenty of time. What happened was extraordinarily transgressive. It had not happened in over a century. This was not the norm. Uh, Senate majorities controlled by the opposite party of the president have considered nominations all the time. And they've done so in election years. Um, it was always assumed in all these very bitter and increasingly public and contentious confirmation fights, it was always assumed that there would have be a confirmation vote, up or down. They didn't just roadblock it. They refused to even meet with him. They just said, oh, Barack Obama, you're not going to get to do this. And, and Mitch McConnell... He, he might have been too persuasive. Well, <laughs> you know, and um, Orrin Hatch said, when uh, it wasn't clear who was going to be nominated, he said, well, you know, President Obama, he could nominate somebody great like Merrick Garland. <laughs> He'll never do that. He'll want to please his base. And then uh, this, this was somebody who... They had all praised and said they would vote for minutes before. Um, Mitch McConnell that summer said his proudest moment was denying Garland a vote. Um, it was hardball politics, but more than that, it was a, it was a shattering of norms just as transgressive as anything Donald Trump did uh, later on. Um, and now, and then four years later, and they said, oh, it's way too close to the election. The next president should have the chance to make this nomination. As you know, when Justice Ginsburg died in September of 2020, they rushed Amy Coney Barrett through. She was confirmed eight days before the election. Given the importance that year of early voting, Donald Trump had already lost the presidency when, when she was confirmed. Well, that's the, what you say. Yeah, yeah well, okay. right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the ballots coming in from China made the difference, I know. But um, uh, the... the uh, uh, and everybody had to do kind of backflips to come up with a consistent position, but ultimately they didn't really try very and, hard. And yet the country and, kind of let it happen. Right. right. And, and you know, some of this is the asymmetry between Democrats and Republicans. Well, that's what I wanted issues. to get to. So, yeah. No, go ahead. You. Well, re Republicans, to their credit, have taken this very seriously for years. Uh, candidates ta have talked about the Supreme Court, about what kind of nominees they would offer. They've played hardball when they have to play hardball. Um, and they prioritized it. They spent capital. Democrats, emphatically, not so much. As you know, every Democratic-oriented political consultant will whisper to candidates or incumbents, oh, people don't care about this. Right. It's not a kitchen table Doesn't issue. Doesn't poll well. Doesn't poll well. It's not salient. People want stuff or whatever. And whereas Republicans understood that these constitutional issues, these values issues, are extraordinarily important to people. They don't just vote on, on tangible goods they can see on their kitchen table. They vote on, on what kind of country we are. Yeah. So let's go inside the court, uh, because you, you focus, you drill into the, the term that in, ended in June of 2022 and, and the big epic-making decisions that, that came out of that time. And of course, I think this past term, uh, we, we've had even more. There have been a bit more mixed mm -hmm. in the outcomes, which have been important decisions. Uh, but how predetermined was it once you had the supermajority that Roe would be overturned uh, and that the other decisions that were made were going to be made? Or was there bargaining that was going on? And was there an outcome that might have been different, even with that supermajority? I, I think it was not a surprise that the court would move to the right uh, in a variety of ways. I think the the brute force of the decisions, perhaps again not a surprise, but was striking. On each of the decisions they made, they went as far and as hard as they could. So Dobbs, um, and when I started working on the book, I will confess that one of my air trepidations was I felt I didn't really know the law of, of reproductive rights as well as I knew some of the other stuff, and I was worried I would get it wrong, and I knew I would have to right quickly between the decisions in June and when the manuscript was due. And then the leak happened, <laughs> which was great, because I got to read everybody's t uh, blog posts and tweets, and then I understood. Politico got the yeah, leak. Exactly. Time, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. President James Buchanan was not involved, but it was a godsend for me for a month of study. Um, so the Dobbs ruling ultimately was not a surprise, in the sense that uh, once it, it, it used to be the confirmation hearing fights were euphemistically about the right to privacy, and this was where are you going to how are you going to vote on on Roe v. Wade for years. Um, but again, the the way the opinion was written 
it, it said Ro Roe v. Wade was, quote, egregiously wrong from the start. And not just that, it, put a, it, it said that the right to privacy as recognized in the Constitution by half a century of Supreme Court precedent, uh, really, because it wasn't in the original written document, it wasn't. And they said, but don't worry, all these other things protected by the right to privacy, you don't have to worry about them. They're not, they're not going to be affected at all. And made a helpful list of the things to not worry about, you know, nice, nice right to privacy. You have their pity if something should happen to it, you know. <laughs> and Justice Thomas, in his concurrence, said, "Give me a break. Of course, there's no logical difference between what you just did and what we just did in Dobbs and all these other things." Um, the um, one of the things I write about in the book a lot, which again I don't think folks necessarily fully understand, is it's not just the opinions. And the other one was the Bruin case, right the day before. But the way they made the argument for the Which opinions was the gun, gun originally, case, right? yeah, the Bruin case was by far the most sweeping Second Amendment case in American history, unquestionably. The Heller case, the Supreme Court had not said that it, the Second Amendment reflects an individual right to gun ownership for self-defense until 2008, quite recently. Um, but it also made clear that you could have gun laws, the strong gun laws. That was written by. Justice Scalia, and they asked someone asked Justice Scalia, "What's the difference between you and Justice Thomas?" And Scalia said, "Well, I am an originalist, but I am not a nut." <laughs> <laughs> Thomas wrote the Bruin case. It said, in in the uh, 12 years since the Heller case, courts had assessed the individual right, but had weighed it against public safety laws. Thomas said, that's totally wrong. First, they struck down New York State's gun law, which dated from 1911, which strikes me as history, too, uh, saying you could not carry weapons in New York City and elsewhere. But that the, o the only appropriate way to assess the Second Amendment right is not to balance it against contemporary public safety needs and laws, only, quote, history and tradition. Meaning, literally, what laws did they have in the colonial era governing guns? And it sounds like a parody, but it's actually how they ruled and how courts have interpreted it. A, an upstate New York federal court uh, a few months later said, well, because New York State passed a new law to try to reconstitute its gun laws, said, well, history and tradition. For it to be a tradition, two laws from the founding era, that's a mere trend. <laughs> for it to be a tradition, you need three laws. And I can find no evidence of a tradition of laws go, uh, banning guns at sleepaway summer camps in the colonial era. Therefore, it's unconstitutional, let alone subways, which would not be invented for a century. And you think this is a parody, but it's not. The Dobbs ruling, the way they ruled, uh, one of the things that scandalized so many people was they cite as evidence that the, the founders did not believe that women should have the right to reproductive freedom. They cite a guy named um, Hale, Judge Hale, six times. He was a British English judge from the 15 or 1600s who had sentenced women to death for witchcraft and had created the doctrine of marital rape, which is that a husband could not be guilty of raping his wife because by being married she had consented. They cited him six times as the history and tradition that our nation must follow. And so to me, one of the things that's so striking about these rulings is not just that they case came, the winner and the loser in an individual case, but the, the first time that there was really a, a, a robust embrace of this notion of originalism, which even when you get the history right, and we all know people fight about history all the time, and the founders disagreed with themselves about what everything means, but even if you're getting the history right, the idea that we in 2023 should govern our country by the social views of property-owning white men in the late 1700s is insane. I mean, no other country in the world does it that way. And in, in England, now, when they have a new proposal for a law, they don't sit around and say, oh, that's a really interesting idea. What did, the question we have to ask is, what did King George III think about it? Because that's what we're going to be governed by. But it's literally the kind of analysis people are being asked to do and now. Well, and that is the predominant doctrine that governs 
decisions in the U.S. Supreme Court today. As of a year ago, there's no history and tradition of relying only on history and tradition. The only other two major cases in the country's history that did it this way were that Heller case and Dred Scott, right. which so discredited it that they didn't try it again for another you know, 150 years. So I want to open it to questions from the floor in a moment. But before I do that, I don't want to presume that this tent or anyone else has a sense of outcomes, results that they're looking for from here going forward. But if one were concerned about the direction of the court and what it means for, for uh, uh, the life of our nation, um, what do you think should be done? How, how, how should people approach this so that they can try to have some impact on it? I mean, a few, you know, all the ways that we make political change. We should talk about it. We should chat about it. We should vote about it. Uh, there buy are buy books about it. Buy books about it. Write yeah. books about it. There, there are reforms of the Supreme Court that make sense. I mentioned yesterday. Well, to you, the, and you were to, on the presidential commission, right? I was, uh, the, I was on this presidential commission on the Supreme Court that President Biden appointed, um, and you know, these federal commissions. Um, they don't always do very much. And they're sort of created often to deflect a demand to do something. And we were actually ordered at the outset to not reach conclusions. <laughs> and we didn't. <laughs> you know, a government agency that works, as intended. <laughs> um, but it was interesting. We heard uh, dozens of public witnesses from left and right, from all across the political spectrum, and they disagreed on a lot of things. Some were for court expansion, others were against. Some were for an ethics code, others were against. Over and over and over again, they said, oh, but I'm for term limits, of course. There's actually a national consensus on this, and it's reflected in all the polls across the political spectrum. John Roberts is, in the past anyway, for term limits. Um, I'm not under an illusion that if it actually moved forward that that nonpartisan support would not uh, fracture. But it could be done certainly by constitutional amendment. We at the Brennan Center believe it could be done by statute as well. Michael, is it common in the developed world and democracies for there to be life, lifetime appointment? Every the, state the Supreme judiciary? Court in the US has a term limit or a, a retirement age. And the constitutional courts of all the other countries that have them have a term limit or retirement age. We're the only ones so who have So we're this. in the vanguard on this. Exactly, with <laughs> okay. history and tradition, yeah. And you know, again, what, what the Constitution says is that justices serve for, on good behavior, but uh, you could, you could uh, well, right, that's not always a given, but um, uh, you could require them to become senior justices at a certain point, which means they still have their job, but their role changes. They don't hear the same kind of cases. So, so I think there's a great deal that can happen. We also should be all thinking about things like state courts and state constitutions, which are an independent bulwark for protecting rights. This, think about this. It, 49 of the 50 state constitutions have stronger protections for voting rights than the US Constitution does. They just haven't been interpreted that way because they kind of have tended to follow along with, with well, the Well, and there was a case this term, right, that helped to reinforce that. It was a near miss, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's a, it was a case called Moore versus Harper, and it was one of the cases where the, this term, the Supreme Court, pulled back at least from doing really reckless stuff, in my view. Um, it, it, was, it was known as the independent state legislature theory case, though calling it a theory is really generous. <laughs> it was a crackpot idea that had no basis in history or law. The idea was that somehow the Constitution had given state legislatures the power to set federal election rules with no checks and balances from state courts or constitutions uh, or governors or voters, and that nobody had ever noticed this up until now. And at least four justices thought it was worth taking the case. But this was something where it was, uh, it was not a left-right thing in the end where um, Judge Michael Ludig, the conservative judge who, who advised Mike Pence that he could not overthrow the election, he joined the legal team. Um, ben Ginsburg, who was uh, George W. Bush's lawyer in, in Bush v. Gore, a lot of the founder of the Federalist Society, a lot of people spoke up and said this is really a bad idea. And so in the end, they ruled six to three. So let, there are a lot of other directions I want to go, but I think we should let this uh, group have the opportunity for questions. So please come to the mics and tell us who you are and have at it. 
Uh, <clears throat> hi, I'm Jay Shepard. I'm curious about who gave the 1.6 to the federal. And was it the Koch brothers? No, it was not the Koch brothers. I'm going to f space on the name. It was an individual business person. He gave his company. I'm, I may be was it mangling this. Was it Scaife? No. no, no. It was not anybody I'd ever heard of. He had a company in the Midwest. Instead of passing it on to his grandkids or whatever, he gave it to Leonard Leo. I assume... He had good tax lawyers, and I hope for his sake that he had a nice deduction out of it. Um, but uh, Leo then was able to turn it into cash for his empire. Gotcha. What's the likelihood of a change in the court as far as term limits by the time your grandchildren are voting? <laughs> uh, that is that the lawyers the lawyers know that is the rule against perpetuities. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think that there's a, I think there's gathering and growing momentum on these issues. At least the backlash to the court is real. Um, when you look at the 2022 midterm election results, for example, um, but, uh, a, a lot of people sort of rolled their eyes when President Biden said, "Oh, th this election is about democracy," and and the Democrats also said, "And about the res and Dobbs." the response to the Supreme Court. And people said, no, you should talk about inflation. You should talk about other issues of that nature. The Democrats had the best midterm performance for a party in control of the White House in decades and without a war. And it was a response to the Supreme Court and its extremism. And voters conflated election denialism with that kind of judicial ex extremism from their view. Another kind of data point, which was interesting, uh, and a lot of this is around the abortion issue in the Wisconsin State Supreme Court election, which people might not have paid that much attention to. Now, Wisconsin, like almost most states, elect their state Supreme Court justices. Um, and Wisconsin is an evenly divided state. The voters evenly divided. It's gerrymandered, so the government is not evenly divided. But they have a Democratic governor and Republican legislature. And that narrow split usually is felt in these elections for judges, um, fit very close races. In April, they had a Supreme Court election in Wisconsin. The more liberal candidate won by 11 points. And it was an explicit, it, it was a referendum on the direction of the courts and on abortion rights. And we're seeing something similar on the ballot this week in Ohio, where there's going to be a ballot initiative on redistricting and a ballot initiative on ab abortion rights. And the state legislature, the Republican state legislature, responded by putting a ballot initiative on the ballot in August, a special election to try to change the rules of how ballot initiatives work so those can't win. And I was actually in Cleveland two weeks ago. It seems as though the, the, the pro-reproductive rights, the pro-redistricting reform side are going to win uh, this week. People did not like their rights being taken away. At least that's, that's what they expect. So these issues are being debated increasingly. I just want them to include structural changes like term limits uh, that can help bring this court more in line with its appropriate role. Perry Molina. Uh, this morning's New York Times reported uh, <laughs> that Justice Thomas bought a $267,000 motorhome, uh, and the source of the funding was quite hidden or mysterious. His behavior seems to me to become more and more egregious. Is there any viable way that he could be removed? Yeah, I, you know, the best, uh, I should say at the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival that the best promotion agent for books on the Supreme Court of all time is Clarence Thomas, <laughs> with, with, with an assist from Harlan Crow and whoever bought him the quarter million dollar mobile home. Um, you know, the scandal, and I, I think the, that some of these issues are overblown, but some of the issues, especially that we've learned about, about Justice Thomas, to me, they're not ethics issues. They're corruption issues. Um, it turns out that his lifestyle for ha uh, decades has been subsidized secretly by at least one very wealthy individual, Harlan Crow, a friend who he met after he was on the Supreme Court. Um, and it had been public. But then the Los Angeles Times did a story on it in 2002, so he's, his response was he just stopped disclosing it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was, again, it was not just tra jet, tra you know, private planes and luxury vacations. This individual, Mr. Crow, 
paid for the education of Justice Thomas's surrogate son and bought his mother's home with her living in it and renovated it. Now, if you saw that in a state capitol somewhere and it was some legislator, we would all know what that was going on. But it was all not disclosed. And then we hear about this with other justices as well. This is among many reasons why a mandatory ethics code makes sense. They are the only court in the country that doesn't have one. Nobody is so wise that they should be the judge in their own case. Um, Congress has begun to move on this. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee two weeks ago passed a, an ethics code piece of legislation. Justice Alito made his own voice heard. He said, oh, they don't have the power to do that. Congress can't, has nothing to do with the Supreme Court. Now, first of all, that's just not true. Congress has passed six laws governing ethics of the Supreme Court over the years. But more than that, I think this case might come before the Supreme Court, should it ever happen. Um, and then uh, this past week, Justice Kagan felt compelled to respond publicly and say, oh, that's nonsense. Of course, Congress can pass laws governing the Supreme Court, just, just like they passed laws for the executive branch. So these issues are not going away. Um, to me, the, the, the other issue with, the, with all the Harlan Crow stuff, and Alito as well had something similar, it's not that they were suddenly, they were liberals and they suddenly turned into conservative judges because somebody bought them a fishing trip. It's that they live and work in a world of chummy privilege with this political machine, the Federalist Society. My, the key thing for me in that ProPublica article that revealed a lot of the stuff about Justice Thomas was a painting from one of these luxury vacations. And the painting is, I mean, the painting to me, it kind of looks like the dogs playing poker. I mean, it, like, it's not a great <laughs> painting, but it's of Justice Thomas and Harlan Crow smoking cigars. But the third person is Leonard Leo. He has made these connections between these billionaires to subsidize their lifestyles, and that, to me, raises real problems. Last question. Speak up. It's, it's not on. influences the types of cases they choose to take on and um, whether they weigh in in a more behind the scenes kind of way. I don't know if that's known or not, but if you could just talk about that a little bit more. So it's a great question. You know, what the Federalist Society does is weigh in the open. And so as far as we know, it's not done behind closed doors, uh, but, but very open. And the influence of the Federalist Society and the fact that they have become the credentialing entity for judges appointed by Republican presidents um, is really significant, not just at the Supreme Court, but at the rest of the federal courts. So you look at all these judges, such as Judge Cannon, who's, who's the judge handling the trial um, for President Trump on the documents case in Florida, or Judge Kaczmarek in Texas, who as a single judge issuing nationwide injunctions is personally trying to ban the use of mefepristone, which is the uh, pharmaceutical abortion drug. Um, these were folks who were um, found and uh, lifted up by the Federalist Society uh, in ways, again, there's always a lot of politics in politics. Law schools are very liberal or progressive. There's no denying that. The legal profession has its own views, and you can't divorce politics from this, that, and nor should we attempt to. But the degree to which this is now a, a very disciplined political machine, I think, is what's unusual. You know, you had judges like Warren or Brennan, who, yes, were appointed by Eisenhower, but sort of didn't rule necessarily the way Eisenhower wanted. And that happened with judges appointed by Democratic presidents, like Justice White, or Republican presidents. They evolved. Um, judges and justices don't evolve anymore. They've been pre-vetted. There's no surprises. Um, that's true among Democrats as well as among Republicans. And that, too, makes it all more political and less feel less like a court. Can I just, one last point. This is a, an unpaid commercial announcement. We can all contribute to the Brennan Center <laughs> if we want to support the kind of work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Michael and Don.
And if I, if I could mention one other thing, having heard uh, Ben Smith and Jacob Weisberg talk about newsletters as this vibrant force, the Brennan Center has weekly newsletters on all these issues. I encourage you to subscribe. And so you're needed at the, the signing tent, so everybody bring your book and wander over there and have your book signed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.